Hello, and welcome to another Health Essentials Podcast. I'm John Horton, your host. One out of three people don't get the sleep they need on a regular basis. Oftentimes, the reason why comes down to bedtime habits, sometimes referred to as sleep hygiene. It seems that what you do before trying to close your eyes for the night may be the reason why they're staying open longer than they should. To help you get the Z's you need tonight and every night, we have sleep medicine specialist Nancy Foldberry Schaefer to join us. She is one of the many trusted experts at Cleveland Clinic who pop into our weekly podcast to share their wisdom. With any luck, what she says will be so enlightening, it'll put you to sleep. Thanks for stopping by to chat today, Dr. Foldberry Schaefer. Uh, glad to have you on the podcast. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. In talking to some friends ahead of this, uh, I was amazed at how many of them have trouble sleeping. Uh, I'm guessing you spend a lot of every day seeing some very tired people. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, uh, at least 40% of us as adult Americans uh, don't get enough sleep. And the most common sleep disorders uh, that are specifically insomnia and sleep apnea affect at least 30% of the population. So across our lifespan, all of us have a high chance of being affected by sleep difficulties. Well, that, that is a lot of missed sleep uh, over the course of our lives, so, uh, which, is why, which is why we're talking about this today, so we can, uh, we can claw some of that back. So um, our topic today is sleep hygiene, which just strikes me as a, as a funky term that, that can easily be misunderstood. Uh, can you walk us through what exactly that means? Sure. Sleep hygiene has been a term we've used in sleep medicine for decades. It really refers to the healthy habits, the behaviors, and even the environmental factors that one can adjust or modify to help you get a good night's sleep. So it's, it's the prep work that we continuously do to ensure we sleep well and to protect our sleep. So why is sleep hygiene just so important uh, for, for, for your routine uh, every night? Well, sleep is foundational to health and wellness. We talk so much about a healthy diet and exercise and forget that sleep is interwoven with good nutrition and good exercise. And now that we live in a 24-7 world, many of us have adopted these habits, these poor sleep hygiene habits that really sabotage us from getting a good night's sleep. And we know, when I say sleep is foundational to health and wellness, we know that enough sleep and good sleep are necessary for cardiovascular health, for metabolic health, and now even for brain health. You've got me sold on the idea that, that we really need to focus more on, on getting a good quality sleep. So, um, you know, we, we always like to give our listeners some uh, tips that they can use and kind of put into action. So can you walk us through kind of some things that we can do before bedtime to kind of set up a good night's sleep? Yes, absolutely. It's very important that we have some winding down or calming time before we expect to fall asleep. Uh, many of us work longer now than we did in the past, or we're used to being on electronics that emit light that can be stimulating, uh, or we're choosing to exercise late in the day because that's the only time we can. Uh, and so really thinking about how we spend the last hour or two before bedtime is important. And it's more important for people who are prone to having difficulty sleeping. Some people are great sleepers no matter what they do up to the minute they fall asleep. Um, one thing we promote is standard bedtimes and wake times. And of the two, the one that's actually more important is anchoring the wake-up time. If we establish a set wake-up time, our brains will learn to establish a set bedtime. And keeping bedtimes and wake times consistent is one of the most important features of treating insomnia. So your body will just kind of naturally set then? If, if you wake up at the same time every day. I take it your body knows I need this much sleep. So you'll naturally start getting sleepy at a certain point every night then. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when we allow ourselves to not have a standard wake up time, we've all done this to ourselves. You know, when we wake up at a certain time during the work week, we let ourselves sleep in on the weekend or we let ourselves sleep variable timing when we're on vacation. We know then that bedtimes become more erratic. So this is a very important one. Um, Another is to think about the environment. 
is my bedroom comfortable? Is the bed comfortable? Is the mattress good? Is the pillow comfortable? Is the temperature right? Uh, and is the the uh, the lighting in the room sufficiently darkened to make this a sleep conducive experience? When, when we talk about temperature, what what should you look to hit? I know we we have that argument all the time in uh, in my bedroom because I like it a little cooler and my wife does not. So what what should be the temperature we should look to hit? Well, our body tempers normal normally drop during sleep, and so most of the time we're recommending to keep the bedroom relatively cool, not providing a specific temperature cutoff, uh, but keeping it cooler uh, usually promotes better sleep. And, um, you know, this can be challenging when multiple people sleep in a room. Same with the position of the bed. Um, we have a smart bed now, but my husband doesn't like, you know, when I wanted to be um, up a little bit because he likes it flat. And so, you know, there we go without you know, with both people have to be, you know, accommodated and that can be challenging. Um, other things are, as I mentioned, keeping electronics out of the room and keeping other things out of the bed that shouldn't be in the bed. So, so in terms of sleep hygiene, the bed is for sleep and intimate relations. It's not for other things. It's not to use my laptop. It's not to watch movies. Um, it's not to, you know, have long conversations. Th those things will eventually promote a sloppier sleep hygiene that in turn will reduce the quality and quantity of sleep. So train your body that when you're laying in bed, it's it's for sleeping, period. And, and that's it. Right. Other things include prepping yourself related to your activities. So so eating lar your biggest meal of the day right before bedtime is not good uh, because, number one, our digestive systems don't function as well at night as they do during the day. So it's not healthy really to be eating late at night or during the night. Um, but also some people will be affected with reflux or will be uncomfortable uh, when eating late at night. Certainly we recommend avoiding caffeine um, and the timing of that really needs to be individualized. Some people can tolerate caffeine in coffee after dinner, whereas people who are prone to insomnia either need to avoid it entirely or may need to have a cutoff in the morning by noontime. Uh, and alcohol is another one. Alcohol is the most common drug used to help promote sleep. And that's because it does have a sedative hypnotic effect. However, it metabolizes quickly and it really wreaks havoc on the quality of sleep, particularly REM sleep. So many people will recognize that their sleep quality is much poorer after drinking alcohol before bedtime compared to having an alcohol-free evening. Oh, that's interesting. Cause you'd think the fact that you fall asleep maybe a little more quickly when, when you have a, a drink late at night, you'd think, oh, I'm gonna sleep better. But it sounds like it just, it messes up with everything that happens from the point when you nod off to when you wake up. Absolutely. It can also increase the duration of sleep apnea episodes, uh, which is one of the more common sleep disorders. Uh, and it can make people feel fatigued and sleepy in the morning. So really, we avoid we like to avoid uh, alcohol before bedtime. Uh, and some people who are really prone to poor sleep choose to avoid it altogether in the evening time. And I think another important point is to, uh, in addition to planning or managing the sleep environment, it's important that we sort of manage our brains. So a lot of us don't start thinking about our next day until we're winding down at night. We're so busy that we're not even looking at our calendar for the next day or thinking about what do I need to worry about for tomorrow until we're in bed winding down. Uh, and that can be a challenge for some people uh, who find themselves unable to sleep because their minds are racing, they're planning their next day, they're worrying about things that are upcoming. Uh, and so people who find themselves in that trap of rumination really can benefit from finding time during the daytime to plan the next day. We we sometimes suggest, you know, keep a keep a journal. Some people call it a worry journal. I'm going to I'm going to spend, you know, 10 or 15 minutes during the day rather than right at bedtime thinking about what I need to do tomorrow or what are the things on my mind that I that, that I need to work through. Uh, and then you can put it away and allow your brain to be free once you get into the bed. 
that advice seems to go hand in hand with what you said about avoiding uh, electronic devices. I, I take it if you start scrolling through social media or emails, that isn't something else that's going to get your your mind worrying and worrying around and, and going to make it harder for you to not off. Absolutely. And there's a lot of literature growing now about how we our our brains react to and how our emotions react to some of what we read on social media. It can be very anxiety provoking and, and people with anxiety tend to have more insomnia than people who are free of mood disorders. You had mentioned exercise and I think a lot of people look at it and you think exercise makes you tired. So if you do it a little later in the day, maybe it'll help you fall asleep. But it sounds like you should do that at a certain point of the day where it, it shouldn't be close to when you go to bed. Absolutely. So exercise is going to rev up those uh, stimulating hormones in the body. And so um, it's important to exercise, key important feature of health and wellness, uh, but do it in the afternoon or in the early evening. Doing it within the hour or two before bedtime can trigger insomnia or trigger difficulty falling asleep. And if you're doing that on a regular basis, that can be one of the factors that help promote a chronic insomnia disorder. Now, what about some calming mechanisms that you can do? Um, I, I, yoga is supposed to be really good at night, right? Yes. And people find, I think what's really important about this conversation is that we all have different sleep needs and we all have different hygiene practices and we all seem to find the tips or, or the strategies that kind of work for ourselves. Yoga is not for everyone, but yoga and meditation are great tools that help people relax at night. And now there's so many apps uh, that people are using. Again, ideal to not have your phone in bed with you. But on the other hand, some people use calming apps on their phone that help them fall asleep at night. And so there's always exceptions to the basic rules uh, that are that really constitute sleep hygiene. So find what works for you and everybody's gonna be a little bit different. Absolutely. Well, ahead of this podcast, uh, we asked some folks on Cleveland Clinic's uh, various social media channels if they had sleep-related questions, and uh, uh, our readers and listeners did not disappoint. So if you've got a minute, let's, uh, let's tackle a few of them. All righty. All right. So one of our followers on Instagram asked if melatonin is worth trying for sleep. Oh, okay. This is a great question. We get this all the time in the sleep center. So melatonin is a hormone that is secreted in our brains. Um, and we call it the sleep hormone because it's secreted in advance of anticipated bedtime to help promote us to fall asleep. And melatonin has now been very become very popular as a sleep aid. And I see patients who are taking it just because they think it's going to make their sleep better, even though they didn't really have a problem falling asleep beforehand. The challenges with melatonin are that melatonin is an excellent treatment for circadian rhythm disorders. So these are disorders of sleep timing. The night owl who cannot fall asleep until two in the morning. Um, the person who travels a lot across time zones and gets jet lag. The shift worker, very effective when taken at the right dose and time. Timing is key to the effectiveness of melatonin. There is much less evidence that melatonin works to just promote good sleep and people who are already good sleepers and or to treat insomnia in people who have insomnia. There are some data that suggests that it's helpful for insomnia, but others that, that it suggests that it's not helpful at all. And what we see in the sleep center these days is that people are going to 5, 10, 20 milligrams of melatonin that can linger in the central nervous system in the morning when you wake up and cause people to be groggy during the day. So it's really important that if you're taking melatonin for your sleep, that you get some advice about the timing when you should take it and what the dose should be or what dose not to exceed um, in order to perhaps benefit from it, but not get the adverse side effects that may come in the morning time. Well, that is a full answer. I'm sure that definitely answered the, the question for our reader there. Um, so question number two, uh, someone on Twitter, Twitter wanted to know if it's okay to just sleep for six hours a night. No. <laughs> well, I like no, that. It, it is, is not. short and simple. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so what should, what should we be aiming for? <laughs> 
Yeah, so the National Sleep Foundation several years ago published uh, recommended times for healthy sleep. And for adults, it's in the range of seven to nine. And that's that's just a range. Some people are nine and a half hour sleepers. And they figured that out because they figured out that when they regularly get less than nine and a half hours of sleep, there are daytime consequences. They're tired, sleepy, moody, um, you know, whatever. Um, there is probably a couple percent of the adult population who are genetically wired to be short sleepers. So they, their brains function beautifully on four, five, six hours of sleep. But the vast majority of us, 98% of us, I would say, need more than six hours of sleep. And recent studies have shown that adults who sleep six hours accumulate toxins in the brain that can lead to Alzheimer's disease. Wow. We need to sleep seven to eight hours, or in some cases more, in order for our brains to get enough deep sleep to clear the toxins from the brain that accumulate during our waking hours so that we do not develop neurodegenerative diseases. And six hours is not enough based on current science to clear those toxins. I, I did not realize there was that much riding on how many hours of sleep I got. That is, uh, that, that's fascinating. And the same is true for heart health and metabolic health. Studies show that people who have chronic sleep disorders leading to six hours or less of sleep are more likely to develop hypertension, cardiac arrhythmias, become obese, develop diabetes. Uh, and these studies are all currently evolving, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that short sleep, and that really includes less than seven hours on average for adults, is harmful to your health. Okay. The last question we're going to tackle, and this is one, one of my favorites. Uh, we had somebody reach out on Instagram, and they said they've been snoring more at night and are, are even stopping their breathing momentarily at times. And she wonders what could be causing that. Well, that those are the classic symptoms of the most common sleep breathing disorder, which is called obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, that is very common, increases with age, increases as we gain weight. Essentially, what happens is that when we fall asleep at night and we lose voluntary control of our airway muscles, the muscles in the back of the throat that control our airway, the airway can get collapsible in sleep. And when the airway collapses enough, we hear people snore. Snoring is the sound that the airway is making, trying to keep those airway muscles open so that we have normal breathing. When the airway collapses completely, we call that an apnea. And when people, some people wake up and realize, I think, I think I've stopped breathing. More often, a bed partner will say, you're not breathing. And, and you know, we'll get nudged to breathe because the snoring culminates in this silence, which is the apnea. And so this is a common sleep disorder. It's a treatable sleep disorder. Significant sleep apnea poses serious risks to health. Uh, and so anyone with those symptoms uh, should report them to uh, their primary care doctor or see a sleep specialist and get yourself tested. I, those are great tips. And, um, you know, I have a feeling after, after this talk, uh, all of us are going to sleep a lot better tonight. So, uh, before, I hope so. yeah, hopefully, uh, so before we put this topic to bed, um, is there anything else you'd like to add, uh, for those who are having trouble sleeping? I would add that if you're having trouble sleeping on a regular basis, more than a couple nights a week for at least three months, it's time to go see a specialist or see your doctor. Um, once sleep problems continue for at least three months, they become diagnosable sleep disorders. We diagnose insomnia, chronic insomnia, based on at least three months of having sleepless nights. And the sooner we diagnose things, the faster we treat them and the better people feel and the more protective sleep becomes for your health. Uh, so don't wait years to, to tackle your, your sleep problem. Um, primary care doctors are increasingly aware of how to initiate a diagnosis and treatment. And there are sleep centers all around the country uh, that can address these disorders. Perfect way to wrap things up. So thanks very much for joining us today. And I uh, look forward to having you back on the podcast. You are very welcome. It was fun. Your body is wired to fall asleep at night, but that doesn't mean it just happens. Taking some proactive steps before hitting the sheets can help you fall asleep faster and sleep better so you're fully recharged by morning. Till next time, be well.